Okay, welcome back. Uh, this morning, uh, we're going to continue our discussion on phase transformations. Um, yesterday, we left off with a discussion of the various microstructural uh, microstructures in steels. Uh, start off with the very, very soft uh, sphero spherodite and um, and then we moved into the more traditional perlite and then talked about bainite and then finally martensite. Now, what I want what I got for you now here this morning is um the first diagram. This is actually a therm isothermal transformation uh diagram, aka a time temperature transformation diagram. Um and this is going to be as I told you last day that every one of these diagrams are unique. They're unique to that specific steel alloy that they represent. Now, I just happen to choose a eutectoid uh, steel alloy, uh, which, of course, we know is roughly at 0.8% carbon. So we just chose that one. We could chose, choose any one, but the diagram would be slightly different as far as its overall shape and some of these temperatures uh, here. So what we've got... Um, essentially is a diagram on the left hand side showing temperatures of course some of the some of the more uh, predominant temperatures that are going to affect these transformational changes and then here we're going to have time scale and this is uh, going to be a logarithmic scale um, this could stretch out you know easily to 10 to the fourth 10 to the sixth you know even half a day something like that into minutes uh, but this is just time in seconds uh, and then on this side, which is the unique part of it, is we're going to have a Rockwell hardness. And this will be a C scale that's going up and down here. So you can kind of see where you're at with respect to what actual product you get. So let's start labeling this diagram. And the first, first thing we want to label is this, this dotted red line here uh, represents the because this is eutectoid, this represents the A1 line, doesn't it? The A1 line, all right? Uh, the lower transformation line, and because it's at 1333. So that means that we have all austenite above that line. Now, the, the diagram is actually just this, this little S. See this S shape here? The S could be a jackrabbit going this way but at any rate the basic sometimes this is called the s curve sometimes actually but uh this is the only areas of concern for us will really just be the areas is kind of look at this as a highway or a river or something but it's just be between these two solid black lines all right as a matter of fact i think i'll go ahead and color these because they have different name different names or different actual we go now this is the green side of this all right and so anytime you see green you would you would suspect that to uh, mean the beginning or start and so this green line is going to represent the green line is going to represent uh, beginning slash start of transformation all right that's the beginning all right now the other side over here defined as the the red here this red portion this is going to represent the end all right or the finish the end or finish of transformation okay now this little dotted line here kind of like the median or something on a highway whatever uh, this represents a 50 percent transformational change this little dotted line like this it's going to represent a 
transformational change. Okay. Now, let's go ahead and label the products. Now, this blue line is sort of a dividing line between what we know as perlite and the other product that we talked about, bainite. Bainite. Okay, that's sort of the dividing line. This, And just so happens, it happens to be sort of right there at that nose, and which, that's what we're going to actually call that. Uh, but so this 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 separates that but again the only thing we're concerned about is this region in between the red uh, and the green and the red lines here that's what's uh, necessary okay now all right so and down here below this, this is this is called the uh, MS or martensite starch. So this horizontal line here is all martensite. That product we talked about as martensite. All right, and it's called the MS line, martensite start. Okay. All right, now. Uh, Let's look, let's look also, again, some things to, to note here. This is actually, uh, this is called the nose of the diagram right here. And it kind of looks like a nose if you... All right, it's sometimes called the perlitic nose, but basically the nose. And that's kind of, it's very important uh, because that represents the farthest to the left apex of this curve and so we call it this little segment here called this referenced as the nose okay as the nose of the curve all right well on the other side of this green line we're still going to have what we call austenite but i'm gonna put a i'm gonna put a uh, unstable well it doesn't matter i'll just put a little a little asterisk there and this means this is going to represent unstable austenite, which means it's just about to uh, to transition or change, uh, but it hasn't yet. All right. So now, if you recall back in the days of the of the phase diagram, we said that no austenite exists below 1333. Well, that's true. That's true if if it's completely done under equilibrium cooling, slow cooling, this is not going to be that way. So that's why we have this this um, this unstable austenite showing up here and here. Okay, so the whole the whole um, issue here is to look at what we call potential or possible cooling trajectories. So let me just draw one in here and I think I'll use this blue line this blue now this is a a, a typical trajectory um, cooling curve and so you know it always must start because we want to get that uh, steel up into the austenitic range so we can again can maximize the carbon uh, absorption uh, then then that's what we need to do so it will always, these diagrams will always start up here. And again, it's just about 50 degrees above that A1 line. So it's going to start there. And then the, the, the three potential uh, quenching medias, as you recall, were uh, brine, water, and then oil. So those were the three potential. So... Right now, we're not going to necessarily identify anything, but uh, it's going to be kind of difficult to do. But I'm going to try to draw a a continuous cooling rate curve, something like this. All right, now that is a this is a uh, well, actually, it's it's two things, but this is this is this is just a potential. Um, or a possible cooling trajectory. 
is this blue line. Uh, this is going to represent a possible um, cooling trajectory, possible cooling rate uh, traje trajectory. All right. T R A J E C T O R Y. Okay, so that's what this is. Now this just so happens that uh, this is also going to be a very uh, special one. Okay, I'm going to put this little asterisk here because just so happens I happen to draw it that way. Uh, but this is this is going to in essence become what what is known as the critical cooling rate the critical cooling rate uh, CCR so that's what this is this is this this actually the way I drew it now looks very closely to what we would consider to be the critical cooling rate now the critical cooling rate is very very special because it defines or represents the slowest cooling rate the slowest cooling rate that yields maximum martensite transformation. Okay, now, a little explanation. This cooling rate, and, and again, we don't know what this is, but it might have been brine, might have been water. It's fairly quick because notice it went from 1,333 degrees, uh, or actually 1,353 degrees, roughly 50 degrees, down to right here to about 400 degrees in less than 10 seconds. All right, in less than 10 seconds. And so, therefore... Uh, because it never this this trajectory this curve because it never actually penetrated okay very important to understand because this never penetrated the nose of this curve or up here or down here it never went into the green or passed or through this green line so therefore it never got into this curve therefore it never became one of these products because had the curve gone inside here, and we'll do several examples later, had the curve gone through here and gone through this, this uh, green portion of the line, the start of transformation, uh, and then threw it into the red and finished, then we would have got that product. We could have gotten perlite, we could have gotten bainite, we could have gotten uh, a mixture of perlite and bainite, we could have gotten a mixture of perlite and martensite, could have a mixture of bainite and martensite, it depends upon upon how that actual quenching method and what quenching media is being used but to begin with I just did a very simple one that just bypassed the whole curve all right and because it bypassed and did not go into any of this portion of the curve here this s portion uh, it's called the critical cooling rate now every every alloy will have its own unique critical cooling rate all right, and now I'm going to, later on, I'm going to tell you what, uh, because again, these, these uh, diagrams are unique to each alloy. Some of these alloys, if they have very, very low carbon content, very low carbon content, like 0.2 or something or less, this nose moves way over here, very, very much uh, to the left, all right, which means there's very little, if any, opportunity to go uh, just and bypass this nose when the nose is so far over. It's just there's just no way. So which means, and and logically speaking, means that there's really not capable a steel with with a, a very low carbon content of obtaining a martensitic structure. Okay, it's just not possible, and that's the logic and reason why because this nose drifts way over here on low carbon steels. Now, the opposite is true. The higher the carbon, the higher the alloying elements uh, for purposes of hardening, which we'll get into um, 
later. I'm going to go over the four or five basic uh, alloying elements when we get into that next uh, topic area. When you add those elements, or more, even more carbon, then this nose moves to the right, which opens up a bigger gap, which means it's easier to get a 100% Martin site structure uh, and because it takes, le it takes more time to do it. You have more time to do it because this, news, this nose would be moved over here, let's say. So it just opens up this gap. All right, so that's what, again, what this critical cooling rate is all about, and that's why it, it is so very important. Now, I need to check the time because uh, I went over, and uh, let me check this time right quick. Yeah, I'm going to have to uh, shut this down, and I will pick this up. I won't erase this. I will, I will just start uh, from here on the next one, but we need to, need to stop this so I don't have problems uploading it like I did yesterday. So we'll stop here and pick it up right after this.